I'm going to start recording. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, we will start this session with Dr. Hector Murillo from uh, Monte Morelos University. And we are happy to have him with us. I met with him a, a few years, I, I believe, since the first uh, um, conference of lifestyle medicine in Peru. I believe. And then um, uh, we have been friends uh, since then. Dr. Murillo, please do a better introduction of yourself, because I know you are the director of the La Carlota, and also you teach in the School of uh, Medicine there. Please go a little more and, and, and explain your, your activities. I, I have to share the screen, sorry. Yes, yes. thank you very much. It's a pleasure to maybe here. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Dr. Neymar. So uh, let's start the lifestyle power. Uh, we have to review health chronology of Seventh Day Adventists of the and the lifestyle power on health. Uh, my interest conflict and my my presentation. I am Seventh Day Adventist. I work at the School of Medicine of Montemorelos University. Uh, I am the medical director of the Lifestyle Medicine Center uh, Vida Sana at La Carlota Hospital. I'm founding member of Latin American Lifestyle Medicine Association and the Mexican College of Lifestyle Medicine Association too. Uh, this, uh, the purpose of this topic is to encourage you to reflect on your health situation and make positive change in your life. Uh, for true, I am uh, nervous because I never, I have never given a presentation in English and I write everything so you can read it if you don't understand me uh, for complete. The ideas presented are personal and do not represent any of the institution I collaborate with. So let's review uh, events of the human history from the Adventist uh, worldview to understand how God has showed humanity how to take care of our health and understand the power of lifestyle. Let's start with God universal laws. These laws encompass eternity existing from the beginning and lasting forever. In Job 38, 33, we find God speaking to Job, questioning his knowledge about the laws he has created, saying, do you know the laws of the universe and how the heavens influence the earth? Now with science, we understand the multiple laws that govern the universe. To mention just, just a few, uh, we have physical laws, the physical laws such as gravity, electromagnetism, the thermodynamics from the backbones of the universe. We have chemical laws. The chemical laws dictate how atoms and molecules interact, forming the basis of the matter. We have the time loss. Time, a mysterious dimension, moves forward, never to return. The arrow of the time marks the passage of events, shaping history and offering glimpses into the acknowledged future. We have loss of the celestial bodies too. The celestial bodies, star planets and galaxies dance across the cosmic canvas, guided by the laws of the motion and gravita gravitation. Their majestic movements have inspired how and wonder through the human history. And of course, the reason why we are here, we have life loss. Life itself is governed, governed by a set of profounding life laws that promotes harmony, growing, and balance. From the smallest organism to the complexity of the human's existence, these laws guide the existence of life, providing a profound understanding of our place 
in the grand temperature of the cosmos. Now we move on the period of the creation on Adam and Eve. In Genesis 1, 20, 29, it says, And God say, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree which is in its fruit, you shall have them for food. We find the principle of a plant-based diet in this text. In Genesis 2, 2 and 3, uh, we can see, we can, we can read, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rest on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made made the it holy because on it God rest from all his work that he had done in creation. In this text, we find the principle of the rest and the Sabbath rest. So let's move uh, to the Genesis 2.15. We find the Lord God talked the man and put him in the garden of the Eden to work it and keep it. Here we can see the principle of the exercise and exposure to the sun while working in the garden. In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of God and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This introduces the principle of making decision or free will. And the Lord God say, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And here we find the principle of the companionship and the importance of the relationships. So just uh, to mention a few of the many principles of health in the story of the creation, we have a plant-based diet, rest, physical activity, exposure to the sunlight, free will, connection with nature, human relationships, and communion with God. Now let's move to the biblical times of the Israel, Israelites. In the book of Leviticus chapter 11 and the Deuteronomy chapter 14, God gave instructions to the Israel regarding to meat they should use as food. He revealed to them that they should not eat blood or fat. God taught them in the clearest possible way the same laws he had given originally, but adapted to their situation as they had lived for a thousand years in Egypt and had forgotten everything. He taught them using simple and clear examples. And we find laws about clean animals, hygiene, isolation of contagious diseases, no consumption of blood, fat, or any, many, many others. Now let's look at the time when Jesus was on the earth. Jesus not only practiced some healthy habits like fasting and walking, but he also elevated the standard by showing that what mother must is love for God and a neighbor. He himself shows that he is life. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the giver of rest to our souls. Jesus is the word. Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus is the water of life. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is God with us. And Jesus is the Lamb of God who gives us salvation. 
Let's move on the time of the revelation to Ellen G. White between uh, 8063 and 8015 from when she received her first vision and through the rest of her life. She had to learn a new lifestyle. She had to change her way of living, sometimes rapidly and other times gradually. Throughout her life, she wrote about avoiding harmful substances like tea, coffee, alcohol, tobacco, the importance of personal cleanliness, the significance of physical exercise, exercising the willpower, natural remedies, reducing meat consumption, moderate in the consumption of salt, sugar, and milk. All of this is known as the health reform, but its purpose is not just live uh, longer, but to serve better and share the message of Jesus. Currently, the Seventh-day Adventist Church promotes a healthy lifestyle, and multiple, multiple acronyms have been developed to encompass all the elements of a healthy lifestyle. But they seem to grow in length and as more important elements are included. In Mexico, an acronym called ADELANTE has been developed. However, there are an others such as creation, new star celebration that you know. However, with, within the beliefs of the Adventists, there are some that are closely linked to health. Here we can see some elements of the acrostic that try to integrate the most possible health principles. The water, rest, exercise, sunlight, uh, fresh air, nutrition, temperance, and other, other uh, principles of health. Uh, in the belief of Seventh-day Adventists, we have uh, some of these linked to health. The first one is a Christian conduct. Adventist belief emphasizes a Christian conduct that includes caring for and respecting the body as it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Adventists are encouraged to avoid harmful practice to help such alcohol, tobacco, and other harmful substances and to adopt a healthy lifestyle based on biblical principles. Stewardship. The belief in responsible stewardship involves recognizing that everything we have comes from God, including our bodies. Adventists are encouraged to be a responsible steward of their health and well-being making cho choice that promote health and proper care of their body, their body, mind, and spirit. And other one, it's marriage and family. Adventist belief highlights the importance of marriage and the family has divinely established institution. The responsibility to care for and nurture family members is emphasized including promoting a healthy lifestyle and providing mutual support to maintain the physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being each other, each family member. Indeed, the Adventist lifestyle has been associated with positive effect on physical health as evidenced by the experience in Loma Linda that you know, which is recognized as one of the blue zones. From an external perspective, Dan Budner assigned the name the Adventist lifestyle to the integration of the following elements in the lifestyle. Importance of faith, healthy community, Sabbath rest, community support, social support, importance of family, healthy lifestyle, and plant-based diet, and physical activity. All these elements together contribute to the health and the longevity of the Adventist community, 
and they are considered integrate, integral components of the Adventist lifestyle. It's a holistic approach that promotes not only physical health, but also mental, emotional, and spiritual well-being. We also have the medical and scientific uh, development of the healthy habits. And as you have seen in previous ses sessions, the beginning of the lifestyle medicine appeared in Loma Linda, led by some Adventists. This new discipline is evidence-based approach. Its main object, objective uh, is the others, the real cause of no communicable diseases. It is movement of physicians and healthcare professionals. The pillars of lifestyle medicine are healthy eating, physical activity, stress management, healthy interpersonal relationship, avoiding uh, 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 avoid of harmful substance and healthy sleep. It's evidence-based. It allows for doses, quantify and standardization, the impact of the healthy on habit, uh, uh, habit on health. Lifestyle medicine is aligned with the Adventist lifestyle, but is not the health reform. So we are here today. Let's review an article to understand the power of lifestyle. Uh, we, we are going to review the evidence and make some example and hypothetical application. The article we are uh, review is this, the name is the impact of healthy lifestyle factor on life expectancy in the US population. The objective was to estimate the impact of lifestyle factor on premature mortality and life expectancy in the US population of 50 years of age. It's based on the nurse's health study and the health professional follow-up study. Five low-risk life, lifestyle factors were defined as follow. A uh, lifestyle score was created ranging from zero to five and its association with mortality risk was estimated. There were 34 years of follow-up and 42,167 deaths were documented. When we review them, identify how many of these you have. The first one is never smoking. If you have never smoked, check mark one. If, if you have smoke, you don't have it. The second one is if you have a normal weight, you check. If you are overweight, uh, you don't mark it. The next is moderate to or no, no alcohol intake. If you do not consume alcohol, you mark it. This article was published the same year as the systematic review that concluded that any amount of alcohol increased the risk of cancer about the small cardiovascular benefits attributed to the wine. So zero alcohol is the best option. The next one is uh, 3.5 hours for week of moderate to vigorous physical activity. If you perform at least five seasons of 45 minutes of exercise, check it. If you stick with 30 minutes of exercise five days per week, which is the recommendation, recommendation minimum uh, of the, the uh, OMS, or do you not engage in any physical activity, you don't achieve it. And the last one is high quality diet. And they use the alternative healthy eating index. 
So what include this uh, index? So let's review. Here are the maximum quanti quantities for each element to archive the highest score in the alternative healthy eating index. Vegetable consumption, five or more serving day. Fruit consumption, four or more saving, serving day. Whole grains consumption, 90 grams per day in men's. In women, seven, 75 grams a day. Sugar, uh, sugar sweetness beverage consumption, zero serving per day. Nuts, legumes, and vegetable protein consumption, one or more serving per day. Red and, and processed meat consumption, zero serving per day. Trans, uh, uh, trans fat intake, 0.5% or less of the total energy intake. Long chain omega-3 fatty acid intake, two or more serving per week. Saturated fat, uh, polyunsaturated fat ratio, 10 or more. Sodium intake, uh, less of the daily recommendation. And alcohol consumption, less of the daily recommendation uh, in, in, the, in this time. So these quantities are for archive the maximum score, although they consider the top 40% to represent a healthy diet, even if not all the maximum score are reached. We can say that a vegetarian diet high in fruit, vegetables, legumes, whole grains, and low meat and ultra-processed foods easily qualifies as a healthy diet. In other, word, in other words, a good vegetarian diet. So if you have it, check. So then I want to ask you how many of these factors you have. You don't have to tell us, but it's very important that, that you know how many you have before moving forward. One, zero, one, more, two, three, four, or five of these uh, low risk lifestyle factors. So I want to introduce you to you uh, two patients. She is Susan. Susan is 50 years old. She is a seven day Adventist. She lives alone, is divorced, has two professional sons and work as an office worker. She never smoke. Uh, the BMI is normal. She never uh, drink alcohol. She make exercise one hour of exercise day and she is vegetarian. So we can we can see she had five uh, low uh, low risk factors. Now I introduce you to Maria. She is fifty years old too. Recently become a Seven Day Adventist member. She used to smoke for many years and used to consume alcohol too. She works at home and at the end of the day, she feels tired and likes to relax by watching Netflix while enjoying her favorite dark colored drink that goes when she opens it. Every Sunday, she enjoys a special moment with her family eating hamburgers and she always chooses the double meat because it, it is her favorite. So we can see, see she used to smoke. The BMI is not normal. Uh, she used to consume alcohol. She doesn't exercise and she had a omnivorous diet. She joined a challenge to eat salad. You can see uh, she's smiling, but she is feeling overwhelmed and wants to go back to her usual eating habits. 
She no longer want to eat salad. So here is Maria and Susan. Thank you, Maria and Susan, uh, for join, joining us. We would like to ask some question to you. Uh, Maria and Susan, are you happy? Yes. Do you help others? Yes. Do you enjoy your food? Yes. Do you love God? Yes, of course. The real difference between they is that Susan has five low risk, uh, low risk factor, while Maria doesn't have any of them. So let's see the results of the story. The life expectancy at 50 years old in women. In the group of zero, it's 20, 29. In the group of one, it's 31. In the group of two factors, it's 34. In the group of three, it's 36. In the group of four, it's 30, 38. And the group of five is 43. So the difference in life expectancy in women between these who have zero factors and those who have five factors is 14 years. So 14, 14 years to move more, eat better, maintain, maintain your weight and not use drugs is too good not to want. But changing these behaviors, it's more complicated that just want to live longer. Almost always, I invite us to think not of 14 more years of life, but of having died 14 years ago. How much we would have missed out on life. So we can better measure what for, uh, 14 years represent. So we can see uh, the life expectancy in years uh, and the, the difference is great. For zero it's 79 and for five years, five uh, low factor it's 93 years. Let's consider some hypothetical scenarios. I want you to identify with Maria if you have four, three, two, one, or zero low risk factor, and identify with Susan if you have all five, only if you have five, uh, all five low risk factors. Now, there are 100 people who are 50 years old living like Maria here, represented in purple. And another 100 people who are, uh, who are 50 years old living like Susan in green. You can choose one from the group that align with your lifestyle habit. If you have five, you can choose from Susan group. And if you have four, three, two, one, or zero, you can choose from the Maria group. As the years go by, we observe the, the age of 60, 65, 70, 75, and 79. And we reach the life expectancy of people living like Maria, which is, which is 79. Life expectancy, it's an average. We can see that about half of the people living like Maria are no longer alive. However, some individuals from the group living like Susan are also not living with us but there is a significant difference between the two groups. 
when we compare their survival rates. As the year continued to pass, we reached 85 years, 89, 94, and finally 94, which corresponds to the life expectancy of people living like Susan. As the years progress to 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, and 100, we see that some individuals reach these advanced ages. It leads us to wonder how they manage to reach such remarkable ages. This illustrates how a healthy lifestyle with low risk factor can play a crucial role in longevity and overall quality of life in the late years. This comparison is fair because we have all six categories now. Please, if you want, identify the category that, that applies to you and choose an icon to represent your choose. For zero, for zero, for one, for two, three, four, and five, low risk factor. 79, we reach the life expectancy of individuals with zero low risk factor. Now let's, uh, let's see the life expectancy with one and with two. And next, those who have three factors and four factors. And finally, those who have five factors. We can stop here. In our example, we see two people who have only two low risk factors and have reached 94 years of age. Let's assume their low risk factor are exercising and maintaining a healthy weight. That means that their poor the, the, their diet is poor, they consume alcohol and they smoke or used to smoke throughout their lives. We can we ask them what are the secrets to live until 94 years? And they reply, my secret is that I smoke one cigarette every day. Possible they do smoke, but that is not their secret for reaching that age because most people who live like them are not longer alive. Therefore, we say that despite having these harmful habits, they manage to reach that age. Years continue to pass, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, and 100. And we reach 100. Suddenly, a journalist appears and say, look at this group of people who reach 100, 100 years. We will discover the secret to reach 100 years. And what they find it's the lifestyle. The healthy lifestyle is powerful. It has to, the, the power to extend our lives, help us to live well, and keep, keep us away from diseases by preventing, controlling, and even reversing them. If we all live healthy, healthily, Instead of having this, we will have this. And there will be more of us to share the message of salvation we have. We will continue to be living testimonies in many other parts of the world. 
So the lifestyle is powerful because it respects God's laws. Because God establishes it in the creation and in the Bible. Because Jesus showed it in his life. Because God revealed it to Ellen G. White for our time. And because science has now provided with scientific evidence that it has the power to prevent, control, and reverse diseases. So we know that for each disease, there are many, there are different medication and procedures, but the lifestyle is powerful because almost all diseases in general will benefit from improved habits. In obesity, hypertension, diabetes, fatty liver disease, and even when facing cancer, you will have better response by having a healthy lifestyle. So let's see conclusions. First, throughout history, God has revealed to us how to, how to have health. Science support the health practice we Adventists have. A healthy lifestyle is powerful because it helps you live longer. The lifestyle we lead is powerful in determining our form and time of death. The path we need to take is clear, but we often prefer to see it through dark lenses. As Adventists, the lifestyle do, does not save us. It reflects that we are uh, saved. Even if you live very healthily, nothing assure that uh, assure you that you will reach 100 years, but the evidence show that you have a greater probability of doing so. An unhealthy lifestyle is associated with premature death, and be careful not to see an incomplete picture. God wants you to have life and have it abundantly. And finally, the lifestyle is powerful because it respects the laws that God, that God has given for abundant life. So he, he are you and I in this moment uh, reviewing the health message we received as Adventists 160 years ago. Have we been able to incorporate it into our lives? I hope so. And I hope uh, you have understood me. And thank you very much. And let's continue the conversation on the social media. Thank you very much, Dr. Murillo. Was uh, was excellent, and um, I I will start with the first question. One of the troubles that we have is within the church, and then uh, we have still people that laugh at us uh, when we mention about uh, being vegetarian and following a good a good lifestyle. So, what could be um, something that we could do to not be responding very uh, aggressive to them and say, hey, you are going to die uh, earlier, but uh, somehow to, to, to influence them on the lifestyle, even though they don't, uh, they, they joke us at us. And uh, unfortunately, as you see in the church in general, uh, less than 50% are vegetarians. So 
they there are a lot of people and even pastors that just ignore the health message and um like this celebration this should, should be a celebration uh, uh, for loma linda here for the whole university and you see how many people are attending and you see and we promote this but uh there is no much interested on that in, in some in some areas so what can we do to and this is for Dr. Murillo, but uh, anybody else could help to respond to people that uh, simply disdain our, our health message. Uh, we, we have to answer them with love. I think uh, love is the most important uh, thing to do when we talk with other people. So we don't have to we don't have to be hard with them. We we try to uh, uh, share the thing we have, but with love, and try to understand that this thing we have, it's uh, it's not easy to understand to other people. So we have this, and we believe in this because God give us, but other people don't understand these things. So first, I think we can share with love and other, other thing, uh, we can use uh, the evidence to show them uh, that it's not only uh, the God's revelation for us, but the evidence can, can respond all things that we have. Thank you. Any other comment and any other question? I agree with our speaker. And I also wanted to say that um, often if examples are used and we never, people that are on the all plant-based diet uh, don't necessarily show or pretend that they're better than anybody else. I think that um, sends a very good and clear message. Identify yourself, uh, please. I say that again. Uh, identify yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. This is Lisbeth Fernandez, and I'm a preventive care alcohol Thank student. Thank you, Lisbeth. I, I have you. recognized your voice, but the audience would not. Okay. So yeah, and I I, I agree with uh, with uh, what the speaker was saying, but in addition to I think that offering perhaps some either, like you were saying, some scientific evidence and even some anecdotal evidence, I think is often helpful. And not pretending that anybody who's eating more plant-based is better than anybody else. So I think that may bother some people. I think another point Another point would be to emphasize that um, I don't feel because I'm vegetarian, I am suffering because of lack of junk food or I'm <laughs> suffering because I'm being depressed because I don't eat those junk. Uh, it, it is fun and you can have pleasure eating right foods and is 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 a matter of learning is a matter of uh, cooking, is a matter of culinary, is a matter of choosing the right foods, but uh, you ended up uh, loving to eat what is good. Who does not like a mango? Who does not like a, a good bean soup uh, being very well uh, seasoned? So those are things that are simple and that are nutritious and that we can learn how to like. Anybody else, please? I think we yeah. feel. Uh, sorry. This is Melissa Klein. Melissa, um, go ahead, Melissa. Uh, yeah, actually, I find it really interesting because obviously I, I went to Loma Linda for all my master's degree and undergraduate before starting the PhD here. And I work at Cal Poly, a secular college. <laughs> and I get a better response from students here when they learn I'm plant-based than I do from other Adventists. A yeah, lot of times I feel other Adventists will say to me, oh, you know, you don't have to do that. And that's just kind of a passe thing. But here I have these 
non-Adventist who come to me, these, these kids and say, you know, how are you so healthy? How do you do all these things? How do you look? I mean, I don't think I look 20, but I'll take it. Um, they'll say, how do you look so young for your age? And at that point I tell them, you don't know how old I am. I could be 12. Um, but th that's kind of the, the interesting part is that I think there's a part of the Adventist culture that kind of believes, oh, well, if you're modern, you do what everyone else does. When everyone else is going the other way, they're looking around and, and I'm very careful to not even say vegetarian or vegan. I just say plant-based. And I encourage all of my students to try it and I question them on what they're afraid of. And, and I just open the conversation and, and kind of like our guest speaker said, you do it with kindness and love and you show them that there's a fun way to do it. I enter, bring food to class sometimes and let them try it. And they haven't had some of these um, and they love it. And then they're more open to it, especially when it's brought in a loving and open and kind of a health perspective way. You know what I do? Um, when they ask me to to do a lecture for the church, I try to to encourage the pastor or the leaders to do a health fair and then invite the community. And then we speak as we are speaking to the community uh, that is more accepted sometimes. Yeah. Instead yeah, of absolutely. keeping uh, beating them with uh, don't eat meat or don't be vegetarian. And so we go to the community and, and indirectly we 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 get the church together. Okay, Neri, you can speak. You can ask or speak now. You are mute, Neri. You are mute. Sure, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. I work here in Loma Linda has been um, more than 20 years and uh yeah, I think, you know, we should uh, share as a simple thing what are we doing right now. I have some uh, two groups, like in WhatsApp, some group from Brazil, some over here, and some of them, you know, uh, in English. I have my boss that uh, uh, also participate in that and two or three more uh, co-workers. We do like, um, I put it like once a month, we do like a detox uh, um, week. So we started one day like fasting, the second day juicing and go on. And three days, we, we are kind of in a, like a raw food. And then we introduce, you know, a little bit. And then I start putting, you know, some notes from uh, uh, the spirit of prophecy or some, you know, like a scientific notes about the, the health. And that has been helping a lot in open mind, especially people now is everybody thinking a lot, oh, detox, detox. So we detox when we stop, you know, eating all the junk food stuff like that is already a detox. So... So that gave me, you know, an opportunity, you know, to share and, and to to learn more with the other people. Thank you, Neri. That's a good a uh, good idea. A good idea. If we have more Loma Lindians practicing this in our in our uh, environment, would be a great uh, a great influence. Anybody else? Yes, I have a question. Uh, Dr. Marilla, you referred to Leviticus 3.17, where it says that uh, the Israelites would eat uh, no blood or fat. And we could add to that Leviticus 7.23, which says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, You shall eat no manner of fat of ox or of sheep or of goat. Now, all those animals that are mentioned there are clean animals. I grew up in an Adventist home, but uh, we were not vegetarians. We did eat clean meats. And uh, that's what was basically promoted in the Adventist churches at the time, that uh, the Bible in Leviticus 11 and Numbers 14, uh, Deuteronomy 14, uh, allowed for the eating of clean meats. It wasn't until I got into my public health studies at La Melinda that I learned about this text in uh, Leviticus 7.23, where it talks about not eating the fat. Now, I don't know how other people do it, but I find it virtually impossible to eat meat without fat and blood. So why is it that we teach one portion of the Levitical law and omit the other? I, I worked 
at one time with an organization where there was a volunteer helping out who was an Orthodox Jew. And he said that there was a Jewish rabbi who many years ago said that when God gave the Levitical laws, he made the restrictions so prohibitive on the eating of meats that in essence, what he was saying is, okay, uh, I am going to give you permission to eat something that is not my preference. But if you're going to choose to eat it, I'm going to make it so difficult for you to prepare it that in essence, you're going to say, hey, this is too much of a hassle. I'll go along with your uh, preferences. So so that's my question. Why is it that uh, this aspect of the Levitical provisions we don't even mention when, when we talk about eating clean meats in the Adventist community? Well, I don't know. Maybe because it's really hard. <laughs> uh, the Jews... Jews are the, I think, the, the only ones I know who try to, to follow this principle. Uh, but in Seventh-day Adventist, uh, I, I, there are only few uh, people I know who try to, to do this. I, I think it's, it's really hard. I believe uh, I believe the problem here is that um, uh, at this point is is being used as as an excuse. So we are not consistent with uh, with the message, but we are using this. Well, the Bible say that we can use the clean meats, and then we stay there. So when you give excuse, you don't explore the excuse too much. <laughs> That's my 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 opinion. Anybody else? Um, Lisbeth? I was, this is Lisbeth Fernandez again. Okay. I was just going to say, yes, that is a difficult topic. And I have presented that in many um, church events. And I haven't really heard any comments from the public at all. But it is something that really needs to be considered because according to the Bible, the blood is where the disease is transmitted. And obviously, we know from scientific research that fats are going to clog our arteries and so on and cause all kinds of chronic diseases. So I think as Adventists, we need to gently present the topic and, and make the public aware of it. Maybe people haven't thought about it before, and I certainly hadn't thought about it until I heard it um, many years ago. So I think it's important that we do that so that people can be a little more cautious about the way they eat. Perhaps um, they can continue eating their meats, their clean meats, if they want to, but maybe they can prepare themselves. I'm not saying that's the best way, but uh, it would be certainly a little bit better than not removing the fat in the blood, which I believe the only way would be by boiling it, which would be very tasteless. Or eating kosher, but uh, who can right. who can eat kosher and it's uh, is not available. It's expensive and and sometimes it's not um, the taste is not good too. Anyways, uh, I believe um, anybody else who has another comment or or another question. If not, we are going to adjourn the session now. We again uh, thank you, Dr. Murillo, for the interesting application of the lifestyle and for sharing that study with us. Uh, and this is, um, this is uh, exciting to have and to share with our um, people in attendance and share with others. So don't forget that I put in the chat that uh, you can have all of these sessions uh, recorded in our YouTube channel um, at Dr. Dos Santos Preventive Care. And don't forget that next week on the same time, we still have one more session, August 3rd at 12 p.m. with Dr. William Andrews that is uh, uh, in the audience today. And he's gonna talk about the spiritual dimensions of the Adventist health message. 
and he's going to share a little bit of his own experience uh, on the Adventist Health Message. By the way, um, I, in, an, in a private interview with him, he said, I would not be alive if it were not by the Seventh-day Adventist message, uh, health message today. So that will be very interesting. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.